Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Stéphane Duguin. I'm the CEO of the Cyberpeace Institute. And thank you, thank you for joining us for the launch of our very first analytical report. And its focus, as you know, is cyber attacks on healthcare. I would like to start by thanking uh, colleagues, uh, partners, uh, volunteers, uh, leaders who helped us to complete this analysis. It would not have been possible without, uh, without this support. And in fact, it started back in May uh, 2020 when we coordinated with the International Committee of the Red Cross, an international call to governments to protect healthcare against attacks. And in fact, to start with, we are honored to welcome um, uh, as a keynote, uh, one of the signatories of uh, this call, whose leadership sparked uh, our collective ambition for cyber peace uh, for healthcare. She's one of these leaders that would do not, we do not need an introduction and we are very pleased to welcome Madeleine Albright. Uh, thank you, Madeleine, for opening this event with us. Cyber attacks in the healthcare sector are, in a word, unacceptable, particularly in a world devastated by COVID-19. In May last year, I joined about 50 international leaders in calling on governments to stop such attacks. I thank the Cyber Peace Institute and the ICRC for driving that effort. And I applaud the Institute for building on that effort through the report they are publishing today. They have worked tirelessly to propose potential solutions which recognize that we must act concretely, immediately, and together. The Institute's work reminds us that protection from cyber attacks needs help from all of us, civil society, the private sector, and governments. We still need governments to do their part among other things, they must abide by international law. For example, recent statements generated by the Oxford process and endorsed by hundreds of leading international lawyers agree that cyber attacks on healthcare institutions and vaccine research violate international law. Governments need to abide by that law, talk about the law, and see that others comply with the law. And in enforcing these and other rules, governments must work closely with industry and civil society. A multi-stakeholder approach is essential. I urge you all to join them and us. Lives are literally at stake. It's a very strong word, Madeleine. And uh, to build uh, upon this, uh, these words and this call, we are welcoming uh, for uh, colleagues, panelists, all of them being, as you will see, at the forefront of the many challenges that uh, healthcare is facing. So it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, John Noble, uh, non-executive director on the NHS uh, Digital Board, uh, Latha Reddy, co-chair of the Global Commission of the Stability on Cyberspace, uh, Robert Mardini, director general, International Committee of the Red Cross, and uh, Marietje Schake, uh, president of the Cyber Peace Institute. Welcome, John. Welcome, Lava. Welcome, uh, Robert. And welcome, Marietje. Um, quickly, to open this panel, I would like to uh, go through the key findings of the report. Uh, it's quite a good opening to, uh, to, to frame the conversation and trigger some questions. Uh, interesting uh, to see that these key findings are stemming from a conversation that we had with uh, healthcare professionals, the testimonials uh, gathered from uh, patients, uh, open source investigation, uh, in-depth discussion also with uh, policymakers and cybersecurity experts. And uh, it, it boils down really to four facts. Uh, the first one is that uh, attacks on healthcare are causing direct harm to people and are threats to health globally. Uh, that was very striking in all the conversation that we had. And also another, another angle, uh, which is quite logical, is that attacks are increasing and evolving as they continue to exploit uh, healthcare vulnerabilities. Um, the third uh, key finding that attacks on healthcare are low risk and high reward crimes. And that criminals and state actors are in fact acting with near impunity. And the last one is uh, that healthcare professionals and patients who are the true victims of these attacks 
do not benefit fully from legal instruments on one end, but also from existing assistance initiatives that are designed to protect them. And building on this, I would like to turn to you, John, and uh, one of these key findings being that uh, attacks on healthcare are attacks against people. How does this uh, resonate with your experience uh, within your existing mandate and during your years as a director uh, of incident management at the UK National Cybersecurity Centre? What was the perception of these threats uh, by professionals on the ground? Well, Stefan, thank you for that introduction and thank you for being uh, being here to, to see the Institute launch this really, really important um, paper. I know it's one that will be really welcomed by um, healthcare professionals and those who are responsible for cybersecurity within the, the National Health Service. Um, as your report highlights in, in May 2017, the, the NHS suffered um, as a result of the, the WannaCry um, attack, which resulted in patient care being disrupted. Um, Following that attack, there was a range of work which was carried out to try and minimise the, um, the, the, the cyber risks and the creation of a um, specialist security operations centre, um, addressing some of the legacy IT issues. However, since then, we've seen the cyber um, threat grow dramatically. It's important to remember that the NHS was collateral damage in an attack that was not actually aimed at the NHS. However, since then, we've now seen, as highlighted in your report, um, particularly um, criminal groups um, deliberately targeting, uh, targeting the healthcare sector. Um, and we're also seeing, again, as brought out in the report, um, nation states um, targeting um, for vaccine research as well as looking for patient data. So, um, and I think it, it's really important that clearly the other factor which we're seeing is that the, the criminal activity is being driven by this new secure ecosystem, as you describe it, and ransomware as a service, which has allowed even more groups to get involved. And they're doing so because they believe healthcare organisations will pay. Um, and, you know, that's a key factor, I'm afraid, which is, which is driving so you asked about the, 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 the pandemic and, and, and what we've done as, as, as um, um, during the pandemic. Well, it was clear to us that any disruption of healthcare during the pandemic could be um, disastrous. So we really looked at it as a national problem. How can we bring the resources of government and the commercial sector to go and try and, and, and help the healthcare system? So... There was an analysis carried out of which were the hospitals which were carrying the heaviest burden of COVID and making sure that there was additional monitoring put in place, that key systems were, were, were protected. And of course, that very importantly, that offline backups were, were provided. And that's what we really thought was going to be um, um, crucial. Um, I think the key thing is that the pandemics caused us to rethink what, how we, dis we describe critical national infrastructure. It's pretty clear to us that healthcare is critical for a um, um, nation, and therefore we've had to put in place the additional resources. So, for example, the National Cyber Security Centre, as you would heard where I, where I was the director, is actively monitoring over 1.4 million IP addresses every day to, to try and detect the early stages of a ransomware attack. Um, NCSC analysts sit virtually alongside those from the from the NHS Security Operations Center, again, to try and stop an attack. And we've had to extend that to beyond hospitals, of course, to, to vaccines, to the supply and our test and trace um, systems. I think it's also wanted to go and say it's easy to go and blame healthcare organizations for um, poor cybersecurity. Yes, it's a fact that there is some critical um, weaknesses, but I think we've also got to, to acknowledge, particularly for in, in the public healthcare space, that if we take funding um, for cybersecurity, it's going to be taken away from patient care. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but we've just got to be able to go and um, justify and show that ultimately it will save money. So I'd like to go and sort of finish on a, a on a more positive note. One of the few good things that we can key, see coming from the pandemic is how digitalization is showing is shown the, the, the promise to really be able to transform healthcare. Um, so you know some um, examples. Um, we've gone from next to no video calls in in the NHS to an average of three hundred thousand Teams calls a day. 
That is a tremendous driver for efficiency. We've been able to take patient data and being able to use it in trials which have led to treatments for, for COVID-19 um, um, patients. And we're also able to take data from lots of different databases and join it together to improve general patient care. So this shows tremendous promise, but it has to be built on secure infrastructure because we have to retain the, the trust of, of patients whose data is being held um, and demonstrate to them this is a secure system. So that's that's the view from, from us in the NHS, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, uh, for this. Um, very interesting what, what you're mentioning in terms of uh, providing a bit of an history. So, and WannaCry is an important point in this history, showing that despite this wake-up call, I mean, the attack continued to, to, to increase. Um, good that you mentioned also the resource issue. That is, a, you know, it is very critical to, yes, uh, healthcare needs to secure, but also needs to have resources, proper resources to do it. And uh, thank you for the opening on this uh, positive note. Uh, Latha, building on this, with this uh, complexity when it comes to uh, uh, threat actors, uh, criminals, state actors, etc., uh, how, how, building from your expertise as a co chair of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace, what instruments? Uh, to you are available to protect healthcare from attacks and in your opinion which one or ones uh, is or are the most promising to address the challenges we are currently facing when it comes to accountability and enforcement in the cyberspace um, well first uh, let me say uh, stefan that i must congratulate the cyber peace institute on having come out with its first analytical uh, report on this very important subject uh, you know, I would completely agree that the main threats fall into three categories, as the report says, that cyber attacks, cyber, cyber espionage and disinformation. Uh, the results, of course, are uh, the ransomware attacks and the economic consequences. Uh, public confidence has been shaken. National security concerns are raised. And there's a reputational damage involved as well for countries and for institutions. Now, in India, we have a particular situation. And I thought before I talk about the global aspect, if I could say a little bit about this. We are a major vaccine manufacturer. Uh, the majority of vaccines are, in fact, produced in India. We have a population of 1.4 billion nearly now needing self safe health care. Uh, we are a hybrid model because in some aspects we're a developed country, in some aspects we're a very, very much a developing country. And we need both technical and physical infrastructure to be improved in healthcare. And uh, the digital data collection is a huge challenge. Uh, so the way I look at it is one way that we can all come together to solve this problem, whether in India or globally, is that government, industries, technology experts, civil society, media, and academia will need to cooperate to combat these threats. Uh, healthcare has become a very attractive target for criminals and for adversaries. And we need to scale up our coalitions initially, nationally, then regionally and eventually globally, and perhaps in some cases in like-minded groups as well. I think the UN, particularly the OEWG and the UNGG, must and in fact need to agree that healthcare should be a critical information infrastructure for all countries. And less developed countries will certainly need a great deal of help both in training their personnel and in resources, in accessing resources to safeguard their healthcare facilities from cyber attacks. I think we must create specific norms for healthcare facilities, as I mentioned, both nationally, globally, and in between, perhaps regionally. Can the UN? specifically declare attacks against healthcare as unlawful and in violation of international law. I believe it can under certain provisions and it should. Uh, 
strong domestic legislation will also be a big requirement for most countries. And there must be much more investment in IT ecosystems in healthcare, both by the governments as well as by the private sector. Uh, the plan by uh, the Cyber Peace Institute to launch in 2021 a digital platform giving details and information on healthcare cyber attacks and the impacts of such attacks is going to be a very useful platform. And I would really urge you to implement that as soon as possible if it's not already done. And I completely agree with the recommendations of the report as well. I think hospitals and health data collectors must be specifically regulated. This is one thing which I think is very important. And the quicker this is implemented, both nationally and globally, the better it would be. Uh, this is particularly where data collection and data protection is concerned. I think we need better cybersecurity experts to be made available for this sector. Uh, let me give you an example. In banking for, and financial institutions, for example, a recent statistic, I think, said that 12% of the budget of the US um, was uh, used for the financial sector, of the budget of companies in the financial sector was earmarked for cybersecurity, uh, whereas only 6% was earmarked for the health sector. And India as well, the figure is only 5% for uh, healthcare. And I'm sure it's much higher for the financial sector. There's very strict regulation on the financial sector by the Reserve Bank of India, the Central Bank of India. Uh, so I think that we really need to look at healthcare as as important, at least, as the financial sector, and declaring it specifically as a critical information infrastructure. I believe will will help us in that uh, in that regard. So I'll I'll stop there for now. I do have some other comments which I hope to come back to later in the discussion, but. Uh, these were some of my, my thoughts about what should be done. The UN should be more active. UN bodies should specifically recognize healthcare as a critical information infrastructure. And this must be followed up nationally, regionally, and globally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Latha, for these words. And um, interesting because in your, in your address, uh, the topic of regulation comes. Yeah. Very yeah. different angle. and uh, and building on what you were saying uh, when it comes to the responsibility and potential action at the United Nations level, I would like to turn to uh, Robert and uh, looking at back in 2020, so the um, International Committee of the Red Cross proposed for the considerations of states participating to the United Nations Open Ended Working Group um, a new norm of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Uh, can you tell tell us more about it? Yeah, let me start, uh, Stefan, by thanking you for inviting uh, the ICRC to take part in this important event and really warm congratulations to, to the Cyber Peace Institute for the completion of your comprehensive and well-researched uh, report on cyber attacks against health facilities. Uh, the question is about ICRC's engagement in uh, UN uh, processes. Allow me maybe to put, uh, put, to put it a bit uh, more in a broader picture. Uh, because treating and caring for the wounded and sick in armed conflict and other situations of violence has always been a defining feature of the history, identity, and operations uh, of the ICRC. The ICRC is operating uh, today in around 100 countries worldwide. Uh, in our operations, we conduct a range of health activities such as first aid, war surgery, physical rehabilitation, healthcare in detention, as well as mental health and psychosocial support. I'm just back from a week in South Sudan, and uh, I was able to visit one of those hospitals in Akobo, in the deep field, uh, close to the border with uh, Ethiopia, where we actually, the only way is to fly patients uh, to get uh, urgent surgical uh, treatment because of the uh, sheer complexity of the logistics uh, there. And, uh, uh, and of course, it's a country where uh, health facilities ha has been 
uh, under attack during the conflict, uh, similar to what we have been witnessing in places like Yemen and Syria, which of course is important, or Afghanistan. So now let me link this to cyber. Uh, and as societies has been pivoting to digital, uh, and this accelerated uh, in the wake of the pandemic, so are armed conflict. This is where for us the link to cyber operations comes in. Uh, and the ICRC is particularly concerned with the potential human cost of cyber operations. This is one area in which uh, the risk of harm to human beings is particularly clear and concerning, um, uh, which is uh, cyber attacks against uh, hospitals. Medical care is not only crucially needed during public health emergencies such as uh, COVID-19 pandemic, but also during armed conflict. And in this respect, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, put the spotlight on an issue that the ICRC has been raising for several years, uh, actually, uh, which is cyber operations uh, that disrupt hospital computers, medical supply chains, or medical devices, risk interrupting the provision of healthcare and pose serious risk to those seeking medical care. If hospitals are no longer functioning, life-saving treatment will not be uh, available. And, and this brings me to the ICRC's engagement in the current UN processes on cyber, in particular, the open-ended working group. So in February last year, meaning before COVID-19 had become a pandemic, uh, the ICRC proposed uh, that states adopt a new norm, which would state, and, uh, and here I, I, I quote, states should not conduct or knowingly support ICT activity that would harm medical services or medical facilities and should take measures to protect medical services from harm. Importantly, the content of this norm proposal was not new. It is building on existing norms on the protection of critical infrastructure from cyber attacks. However, in light of the particular vulnerability of healthcare facilities, we believe that it is important to emphasize the particular need to protect them. It seemed uh, that this proposal came at the right time over the, the past year, and in light of the increase of cyber attacks against medical facilities during ongoing, uh, the ongoing pandemic, this issue has received a lot of attention and was discussed by states and other experts. So where are we now? In New York, as we speak now, states are uh, and others are meeting for the final session of, of the open-ended working group, aiming to negotiate and agree on a final report. From what I understand from my colleagues who lead this process, uh, there, will not, uh, there will not be a new norm on the protection of healthcare facilities. However, there are good chances uh, that states will underline the importance of protecting healthcare facilities and states uh, explicitly and state explicitly that existing norms that protect criti critical infrastructure are also protecting medical facilities which is essentially what the ICRC suggested so let me conclude with one important point we are under no illusion that these processes in new york and uh, such a norm will put an end to cyber attacks against hospitals. However, we do hope that the discussion on this norm and the agreement by states on the importance of protecting medical facilities brings further attention to this important issue uh, that states honor their commitment and will respect and protect medical facilities. And finally, that this will be one piece in the puzzle towards preventing such attacks from happening. Over to you, Stefan. Thank you very much, uh, Robert, uh, for this. And thank you for uh, starting with highlighting what is at stake here. This is the human cost of this cyber operation. So and interestingly, how the whole logic of protection is, is stemming from, uh, from it. Um, turning to you, uh, Maitje, um, and uh, having in mind what the, the previous uh, colleagues mentioned when it comes to uh, the need for regulation, the fact that public confidence has been shaken and looking into this uh, uh, human cost of operations. Uh, I mean, there is today no standing or at scale or transparent and independent mechanism to track accountability in cyberspace. Uh, what's your view on a strong accountability framework and will it increase responsible behavior in cyberspace? 
Well, thank you so much. Um, I mean, the, the aim to have more responsible behavior and to build mechanisms of accountability is incredibly urgent. Uh, Secretary Albright started by saying lives are at stake. And the previous speakers with various examples have shown the real human cost of cyber attacks on healthcare facilities. And I think that that's really something that we want to stress, that this is not an abstract notion of technical methodology uh, that is used to extract resources or to gain geopolitical advances or engaging corporate espionage, for example, but really that the victims that we should have in mind are uh, the doctors that can't do their work, uh, the stress and the resources that have to be redirected after a cyber attack, the patients that cannot be helped uh, even as their situation is urgent, the delays that are incurred uh, in getting vaccines in place in the right time. I mean, uh, the, the moment at which attacks on healthcare facilities are increasing, uh, is no coincidence. It is because we all rely so much on well-functioning uh, hospitals, vaccine labs. And the, um, the problem that we have identified is that the perpetrators know very well that the data that's at stake is ex incredibly sensitive. I mean, everyone who in other debates about tech governance may say, oh, well, you know, I have nothing to hide. I don't care about privacy, will probably think twice when they know that their medical data, the most intimate details, the most sensitive details are at stake. And the problem is for, for you and I, for most citizens, this means being extra careful. Uh, this means uh, treating according to the highest standards, this data, each other, and to take care. Uh, particularly that's you know the duty, the obligation of doctors and, and um, medical workers. But for for criminals, uh, the sensitivity of the data actually makes the attacking more attractive. And often the victims are unprepared. You know, the core business of hospitals is to treat patients. It's not to keep out states or criminal groups uh, out of their computer networks. But unfortunately, that's where our focus needs to go. And this is where the question of accountability becomes so important because it is increasingly clear that perpetrators are calculating you know, in which way can we best get away with our cynical, illegitimate activities, but without being punished? So we need to really break the um, impunity. We need to break the profit model. And we need to show, uh, in the interest of, you know, the whole concept of the rule of law, the whole concept of accountability, the concept of justice and fairness, that there will be consequences attached to those who seek to attack healthcare uh, and medical facilities with uh, people as the main victims. But the problem is that in order to get more political will, more awareness on the part of different actors in this whole you know, ecosystem that needs to change, we need more information. And this report can hopefully contribute to that because by showing that this is a, a human cost that's being paid, that this is an increasing problem, by shining light on the methods and the ways in which these attacks are waged, what we hope is to have a broader, more accessible sense of what is going on and a debate among more people that are, are gonna join us in saying, this has to stop and we need more accountability mechanisms. And so uh, basically it reflects the whole mission of the Cyber Peace Institute that says, you know, we need to focus on who are the victims of attacks, humanize, the, uh, the story and the facts that we bring to the table, bring those facts to the table in the public, uh, not just uh, in the view of cybersecurity firms or in the view of intelligence services or in the view of systems analysis. We really need to have a public understanding, a broader understanding of what is at stake in order to push that change. And in the report, you will find concrete recommendations to governments, to international organizations, to civil society, but also to the private sector, which you know, is all too keen to claim a big role when it suits them, but doesn't always take maximum responsibility to optimally protect systems and to build the best possible security and software. And as we rely more on those commercial systems, it is, it is clear that we need to have a better sense of uh, where risk might lie, that that risk analysis needs to be um, in public view, and that a sort of chain of responsibility has to be clarified and, and optimized where there are still weak links that can be exploited. 
So I think there's a lot of work to do and certainly closing the accountability gap has to help in attaching a price to these crimes and to hopefully making them less lucrative, less attractive and um, well, less favorable to the perpetrators. Thank you. Thank you, Mariche. And uh, echoing what you were just saying, attaching a price to, uh, to the crime is uh, quite a compelling and uh, good description to the, to the challenge at hand and to the reality. Um, just to remind to the audience that uh, it's possible to ask a question directly to the panelists, so uh, don't be shy and please feel free to use the, the chat in, uh, in, in the YouTube live window. Um, in the meantime, uh, I have a specific question when it comes to resources. So the resource question was in between all the uh, the answers so far and uh, two aspects to it. The first one is this fact that healthcare today is under resources and understaffed when it comes to the capacity to face actors who have way more capabilities when it comes to attack. That's the one. And the second is that there's already uh, assistance initiatives that are existing, that are live, where people are spending a lot of time and they are really wanting to help, but it's not really well known or not used at the scale that it could be uh, could be used in order to have a better impact. So I don't know who would like to, uh, to jump on this one, this uh, balance in between resources missing and what is the responsibility of states or industry when it comes to that problematic, but also to the fact that resources are there, but maybe not used in the, in the right way. John, would you like to have a go on this one? Yes, of course. And um, as, as I, in my introductory remarks, I um, um, hopefully flagged up some of the um, the, the resource um, challenges which are um, which are there. Um, I think you, you hit a, a critical point here. It's about how do we find the right level of in, investment to go and um, um, support this? How do we take best practice, which 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 one country de you know, develops and sees success with, how do we share that around internationally? And again, I hope that's one of the things which will come out of this um, excellent report as we ident as you've identified some, um, some best practice, because there's also going to be these finite budgets, but um, there's a problem in that, you know, the commercial cybersecurity world will always say that this particular solution will solve all the problems. Clearly it won't. Um, there's a range of solutions which 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 are going to be to be needed, and in certain cases, as we've heard earlier, actually the um, um, the commercial cybersecurity world can make it more difficult having products which um, um, are no longer supported, um, building into specialist healthcare um, um, equipment, uh, the inability to ever update it and create. Um, vulnerabilities. So we really need to, and again, I think this comes out in the report, tackle this this, this issue of resource at every different um, level, um, from the way that the healthcare um, IT professionals go around this work to the way that we view it at a, a state level, um, but also how we collaborate with the commercial world, where unfortunately at the moment the incentives are often actually just to compete with other um, providers and not really taking into account what are the actual needs of healthcare. I think one of the good things from the pandemic is that it's cr created a tremendous amount of goodwill to those medical professionals who've been looking after us all. And we need to be able to go and um, exploit it's the wrong world, but I use it anyway. We've got to go and take advantage of that, that goodwill and, and get people to focus on this issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Um, best practice sharing for sure. Uh, the fact that uh, we could see because we discussed with this uh, assistance initiative that they are there ready to help. But something that is sometimes not really understood is that asking for help is costing resources and being in capacity to receive help is costing resources that someone sometimes healthcare do not even have. So the baseline is quite complicated. Uh, Marichi, would you like to, to add on this question? Yeah, maybe more from a public policy point of view, but the pandemic uh, has really revealed how much we need well-functioning healthcare systems, public health systems, and under how much pressure uh, nurses, doctors, uh, lab assistants really already are. And as a result, you know, if you're running a hospital, 
you have a choice. Do I hire an extra person to care for patients or do I invest more in software and in the protection? And I actually find it from a human point of view, understandable that the patients would go first in priority. But, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of trade-offs between short-term and long-term investments. So obviously, uh, we've seen also with the WannaCry attack that oftentimes outdated versions of software used in hospitals made them particularly vulnerable. And I think from a sort of society-wide point of view, the question then becomes who should be responsible? So how do we know where those you know, weaker points or potential risks really are? And how do we sort of scan and, and make sure that uh, the, the lack of resources on the part of the healthcare sector do not not only lead to too much pressure on the humans that are taking care of patients, but also lead to unacceptable risk in the networks, in uh, the IT systems that can be exploited. And I feel like that's a systematic problem where there has to be new, have to be new approaches to tackle those because sure, you know, public safety and public health are in the public interest and they legitimize public spending. But the pressure on, on public spending is enormous, will probably only intensify. So having requirements on the part of the private sector, being very clear, for example, about procurement standards before systems are bought that could lead to either lock-ins or down the road risks that are unforeseen at the moment of purchasing are all ways to be smarter with the resources that we're gonna spend. So I think the idea of uh, investing in safety may seem more cybersecurity in, in preventing uh, these attacks from happening and shoring up the resilience may seem and is a big expense compared to the status quo. But of course, the cost down the road is higher if you allow this systemic risk to go on, if ransomware attacks can happen where actual ransom might be paid, where systems are down, where systems are destroyed where expensive uh, repair and um, uh, substitution mechanisms have to be put in place. So it's a matter of investing in the right protection and the right people at the right time. And I think there needs to be a sort of um, assessment that is being done in the public interest to understand where the critical weaknesses are and how they can best be shored up. Thank you. And thank you, Nigel, for expanding on this. Um, Linking to, 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 to that aspect of the question, I mean, uh, Latha and uh, Robert, you mentioned this before. There's, um, how, how can you, how can we ensure this link in between the reality of the societal and human impact of these attacks, uh, the reality that's happening to people, so that cost, to the decision making and policy discussion and normative discussion that we see happening at uh, domestic or international level. Uh, how, how do you feel that this gap can be bridged? And uh, how well do you think that are informed uh, the, 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 the policymaker and policymaking in this field? Uh, Latha, Robert, please. Uh, before I come to that, uh, Stefan, I wanted to uh, comment on um, what um, what what uh, Mariche talked about, you know, the need of resources and how we use the the resources. Uh, you know, I think we've we found a model that works in India. You know, we had even prior to the healthcare attacks, we had um, concluded a number of agreements with countries uh, who had asked for help on cybersecurity. These were countries that perhaps saw India as uh, having more capacity in this regard and also having models that were easier to implement in developing countries. Uh, I think we also could help them with uh, basic cyber protection tools, uh, which are easier and cheaper to, to implement. We help them to set up certs, for example. And that same protection model could perhaps be extended to uh, these as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, even as part of our, um, what we call our development partnership agency in the foreign ministry, I think this aspect could come in, you know, the question of how do we use some of the funds allocated for the least developed or less developed countries 
to uh, to help them create these sort of protections for their healthcare sector against cyber attacks. And uh, just a, just a thought also off the top of my head, maybe fora like the global forum on cyber expertise, you know, the GFC could uh, could also help in this specifically to help protect the healthcare sector. Uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, I think I've gone a little off topic on your question. Stefan, could you just repeat it uh, on the what you wanted me to comment on? No, no, of course, of course. The anything to question that we start receiving, in fact, in the chat, it's uh, and I will put one of uh, these here. So thank you, Shital, for asking. It's um, it's really in terms of the public awareness and also the link to the reality of what is happening in the field and how yeah. this can help to put pressure on the implementing framework or setting up a framework. But I think in a sense, we did cover that, didn't we? When we talked about what the UN could do and uh, what, uh, you know, how national policies need to be stronger uh, and uh, then later translate into regional cooperation and then global cooperation. So I don't think I have a specific point to add to that. Thank you. Thank you, Lata. The, the, the question was really going into the uh, how to, to, to bridge this knowledge between the reality of what is happening in the field, the reality of attacks, and how it, yeah. um, it, uh, it helps policymakers to really understand what is at stake. So I don't know, Robert, if you want maybe to add on this. Well, I would say Sorry. that, uh, for instance, I, I like Marije's point about looking at the victims, you know, rather than uh, as, uh, you know, thinking of it just as an attack, you know, a cyber attack and a weakness in a cyber system that we really concentrate on the human cost of what it is. And, uh, uh, you know, I think those stories are very important and I'm glad that the CPI is concentrating on that because, in fact, I've made some some notes on that and I said there are huge psychological effects, you know, there's uh, fear, there's the sense of lack of control, there's a lack of trust, there's stress, there's anxiety, there's supply chain mistrust, there's fears about the disinformation that's being spread. So I think when you look at it from the victim's point of view, that's very important and therefore Perhaps the message has to be tailored more to the victim and less, as you say, to big business or to the big healthcare providers or vaccine manufacturers. You know that uh, victims also need to feel that someone is standing up for them and uh, understands what they are uh, going through. And that in turn could influence policymakers, uh, you know, to realize that the public is very, very concerned and is very deeply affected by these uh, developments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Robert, on, on this, we have to add something. And I have also another question for you, Robert, that just appeared in the chat. I will leave it afterwards. I endorse what uh, Marice and uh, Lata said. Uh, and this comes also from our experience in the real world now where uh, when hospitals, uh, health centers are being attacked in the field, it is so important to highlight uh, the human cost of those attacks and the consequences. Uh, you have always the immediate cost of uh, those patients uh, and the uh, health personnel killed on the spot, but then uh, all the ripple effects of all those who will uh, lose uh, access to healthcare uh, facilities. And I think in the cyber space, uh, this is not known enough and it needs to be socialized, documented and uh, brought to the, to the public attention so that it becomes also a priority of policymakers, uh, parliamentarians at national level, but also uh, at global level uh, within the UN. But this is not enough because unfortunately what we see at ICRC, if you take just the, you know, the scope of armed conflict, there are very robust uh, rules and norms, international humanitarian law, the Geneva Conventions, uh, uh, their additional protocols and so forth. And very often there is a gap between very clear rules which tell you it is prohibited 
to attack health facilities and the practice uh, that we see on the ground. And I think uh, to all the, uh, the, the policy work, uh, you need to add uh, protection. And I think uh, uh, hospitals are considered as a public good. Uh, there should be ways to, uh, to protect them from cyber attacks. And uh, I think here I see Bridget with the private sector that can uh, maybe offer um, uh, support and protections uh, at lower cost for uh, such, uh, uh, you know, public goods and national legislation should incentivize uh, this uh, and should cri criminalize cyber attacks to, 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 to be able to work on all fronts in order to protect at the end of the day, the patients. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And if someone wants to build on, on this. Yeah, maybe John or I can just add something. I mean, I think it's easy to, to focus on the expenses and to be critical of those, but uh, there has to be an honest trade-off about which costs may be incurred to protect and which you know costs that are much less predictable and also uh, benefits that go to, to criminals or adversarial states. You know, it, you cannot really compare, let's say, one dollar to one dollar, one euro to one euro. I mean, there is a responsibility to protect civilian infrastructure. There is a responsibility to protect citizens and national security, as as uh, Latha also mentioned. And um, I think I think it's it's let's say too shallow an analysis of what the actual price to society is of basically not preventing sufficiently. Uh, the success of, of criminals or hostile states from from succeeding with these cyber attacks, not imposing more responsibilities on the part of the private sector, uh, not protecting citizens. The price is also articulated in an erosion of trust, uh, in in um, you know, in fear. You know, there there's multiple aspects here that I think you know we cannot just look at. Oh, what is the what is the monetary price tag to shoring up cybersecurity? It's it's a society wide problem that has to be addressed. I've never heard people complaining about you know um, expenses for let's say um, uh, excellent education or or uh, research just because people know what the price would be of an uneducated um, population as well. So you have to look at both sides here. No, thank you. Um, John, would you like to add on this? Yeah, I, I think the other the other thing which we really risk is undermining um, public confidence in, in digitalization within the healthcare sector. Um, certainly in the UK, we rely on people voluntarily opting in to make their data available for, for research um, and also to allow much more effective and, um, um, treatments. If you lose that confidence because you've not invested in secure infrastructure, then your whole digitalization process, which is so important with an aging uh, population with more pressure um, on healthcare organizations, that will just go. So we have to, we have to invest. Thank you. Thank you, John, for uh, this clarification. Very, very int important point that you all raise when it comes to the, the reality of the resources, the uh, the appetite for investment. It's also quite, I mean, everyone knows that it costs always less to invest in prevention rather than to uh, um, make expenses in recovery and rebuilding. But still, I mean, uh, we saw that in other global challenges, not uh, always uh, put into practice with actions. Um, going back to the to the idea of what kind of information is there in order to really describe the reality of the threat. Uh, that's what we tried in this report, in terms of looking into what is happening to healthcare professionals, what is happening to patients, and what is it they are facing. And they are facing uh, attacks to disrupt their capability to work. They are facing attacks to steal patient data in order to uh, transform them into a monetary gain. They are facing cyber espionage. They are facing disinformation. But at the end of the day, this is always the healthcare professional, the patients, and through them, uh, society. Um, and we uh, believe that there's a role for um, civil society, academia, etc., to, to inform also policymakers about this. And we have a question from Shital in the in the chat. I just put it here. Um, that's we we uh, emphasize uh, the work of uh, the importance of the work of a collective effort. Um, but uh, the discussion so far have been very inclusive for non-governmental stakeholders, uh, to say the least. Um, who would like to, uh, to to comment on this one? Lafa, I think you're mute. Please. Yeah, 
myself. Sorry. Uh, I'd like to just mention this, uh, talk, talk about this a little because I agree. Uh, there has been there have been problems in the UN fora about allowing uh, NGO voices to be heard. Uh, I don't think the issue is really with the UN. You know, the UN would be, I think, more open to that. I think it's individual countries who have objected because uh, they feel that sovereign some countries feel that. A sovereign country has a different standing and a different status from an NGO, and uh, we shouldn't be speaking on the same uh, platform, you know, a, or shouldn't be heard in the same platform. So, I recall when, on behalf of the Global Commission, I was asked to speak to the Open Ended Working Group uh, in New York. Uh, the the uh, UN staff were very apologetic about it, uh, as was the chairman of the OEWG, but he said delegations had raised the point that uh, a non-governmental organization, whatever we said, could not be part of the official record and therefore it would not be part of the formal session. And therefore, I would have to make my comments before the session formally started. As it happened, most of the delegations were there, except uh, one or two who I think made it a point to enter the, uh, the chamber only once the comments were done. Uh, so, you know, there are these issues uh, that uh, civil society, NGOs don't get an adequate voice sometimes in the UN system. But it's a very tough call for the UN um, staff because they ultimately would have to go by the instructions of the member states. So I don't think it's the UN itself. I think it's only when states themselves realize that only a multi-stakeholder uh, model really succeeds in this as in so many other fields, that you will have a completely integrated dialogue. At the moment, we have to confine ourselves to the multi-stakeholders um, interacting in more informal ways and then finding their own ways to convey their messages to their policy makers who hopefully will incorporate them into their final decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Lada, for explaining on this and describing the reality of um, how it works. Uh, John, you wanted to add something? So, um, as the, the reports brought out, raising the cost for those who are carrying out these attacks is a key requirement. And part of that is attribution. The problem, though, with attribution when it's done at a state level um, by, by certain governments, it's then immediately put down to be part of international politics. I think this is where NGOs have got a really powerful voice to, to say what is what is unacceptable. And civil society has, has that to, to, to highlight what has happened is really, really powerful, sometimes more powerful than just states themselves. So I really hope that we can build on what's in this in, in this report and help to raise the cost against those who do it and the countries who are allowing this activity to happen, the criminals to operate from within their country. We've got to put a cost and the NGOs definitely have a role in that process. Thank you. Please, uh, please, Robert, please. And, uh, and I would say I endorse everything that was said by colleagues. And I would add that if you want also to advance in the policy space, we need to be cautious because we are uh, navigating a very polarized world. I give you one, just one example. Uh, what should be a no brainer, you know, cyber attacks against health facilities. Uh, are against international humanitarian law in situation of armed conflict. Even this straightforward statement that should be unchallenged actually was challenged by states, and they, uh, they, uh, th their pushback was not uh, the statement in itself, but saying, yes, ICRC, you're saying this. It's now you are encouraging cyber attacks to happen, uh, which, of course, is not true. But it, it's an indicator of how sensitive these conversations are in the multilateral space. And if we need to generate consensus and uh, upgrade existing policy and law uh, to, to really make it, uh, you know, harder uh, for perpetrators to, to come in, uh, starting with uh, uh, 
a situation of armed conflict, uh, we also need to navigate th these very difficult waters. Uh, That's very, of very course, the role of NGOs is very complementary, and it's not one to the detriment of the other. We need to work on all fronts at the same time. No, it's very valid point that the context is very important in understanding uh, how this uh, discussed played and uh, all the tension when it comes to geopolitics that are behind each and every statement is important. In fact, there's a question that's interesting in the chat coming from uh, Clara Jordan. Um, what role do you think do journalists or media have in changing the status quo, the way we portray cybersecurity challenges? And it can be ties into, you know, this consciousness, uh, this awakening on a certain uh, level of decision making about what is really uh, happening. Anyone wants to take this one? Yeah, I mean, I can start. I think obviously journalists should be free and are ideally free to report on whatever they think is important. But we should also appreciate the, the challenges to, you know, truly understanding and getting the proper access to information, access to information on the part of governments in terms of what is happening. When it comes to cyber attacks, you know, a lot of information is hidden. Uh, it, is, it is not disclosed by governments. It's hidden uh, in, in, uh, in the servers and analysis of cybersecurity companies, of companies that are themselves subject to attacks. And so um, I think First of all, making sure that there are the proper uh, skills for journalists, uh, you know, educating them, uh, but also actively thinking about the need to provide access to information, allowing that kind of scrutiny over these extremely important facts. You know, um, the the idea that there that there is state to state escalation happening over digital systems, uh, that civilian populations or uh, targets are in view of perpetrators, that crime is escalating across borders to uh, include attacks on hospitals. These are newsworthy and important stories that have technical, but obviously also human components. And so I, I hope that journalists will actually be curious and inspired to report more on this whole field of, you know, anything from, from methods of attacks, uh, perpetrators, the questions of where accountability should come from, what the victims' stories are, to, to help people understand what is at stake and why the status quo is actually not acceptable. Thank you. Thank you, my chair. Robert, you wanted to, uh, to chime in. No, absolutely. I mean, the role of uh, journalists and the media is absolutely critical. To make this issue visible uh, will, uh, uh, will, will also put positive pressure on... Uh, uh, on political authorities to to take this to tackle this issue more seriously and also uh, incentivize uh, you know the the private sector the tech companies to also be offering uh, solutions and protections at at a lower cost uh, so absolutely and this, today this issue is not really visible in the public domain and of course making it more visible with facts figures uh, and stories will certainly help the issue move move forward. Thanks, uh, thanks, Robert, for this. Uh, another question coming from the from the chat, which comes to the to the threshold. But before John, you wanted to chime in. Sorry. Yeah, I, I wanted to go and um, add a, a, a point on on Clara's excellent question. Um, I think the media has got a really important role in helping to explain cyber and what it is. You know, and one of one of the uh, the big challenges that often people who are, for example, on on the boards. Uh, who, of any organization are making a decision around cyber, they treat it as just a, a technical issue. Mm. Well, yes, of course it's deeply technical, but also, as, you know, as this report brings out, it's about people. So having um, um, media being able to explain cyber um, and the fact that this isn't just about technology is really, really important. And so the more interest we can get from the media in this subject and the impact it's having, the better. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, John. I, this, uh, I'm afraid to put this question because it's going to trigger a long answer, but uh, it would be too bad to pass it. Um, question about thresholds of armed conflicts and how can I have uh, in Geneva Convention enforced an international address if attacks on hospital are below this threshold? Someone wants to use a one minute to on this one? <laughs> it's kind of a challenge. Yeah, this, I mean, if I may, uh, yes. this, is, uh, this is a key question because, uh, I mean, if a situation is uh, considered as armed conflict, uh, 
then international humanitarian law applies and the cyber attacks are against health facilities are against the law and are amount to a violation of international humanitarian law. So, so the whole thing is to is to qualify this. Uh, at ICRC, we do this in, in real life. We have uh, uh, very clear uh, criteria uh, ranging from the level of organization of uh, the parties to the conflict, to the, uh, to the intensity of attacks and so forth. And I think uh, that uh, this, is, um, uh, this also covers cyber attacks. So uh, technically, I don't see a challenge here, uh, to be quite frank. Uh, the challenge, of course, will be to to trace the perpetrators and to have the dialogue. Because in, in real life, the ICRC have private conversations with uh, parties to the conflict to remind them uh, of their obligation under international humanitarian law. In the cyberspace, um, identifying the perpetrators can uh, prove tricky. Uh, and that, that is the challenge I see, uh, the immediate challenge I see today. Thank you, Robert, and uh, thank you, everyone. In fact, I'm conscious of the time. It's been, it's been one hour already. Uh, thank you very, very much for being with us uh, on that day. It's quite important for the Cyber Peace Institute. It's our first uh, report and uh, on a topic that is, um, that is very uh, close to our heart and very sensitive. So thank you for, for this. Uh, you'll find more information on the screen about the report itself uh, for the audience. Uh, would you like to, uh, to read it? and? Uh, uh, please feel free to contact us, comment, uh, and stay tuned because this is one of the many steps that we are committed to take when it comes to addressing this uh, this uh, challenge. There's been so many wake-up calls over the last uh, decade when it comes to attacking the healthcare. Can you imagine that the first one somewhere on uh, healthcare was in uh, 1989? It was still on the floppy disk, and here we are discussing about attacks on healthcare. So we are really committed to um, have uh, a coalition, be part of a coalition in order to address that threat and um, and yeah, try to have a real real impact on what is happening to healthcare professionals and patients. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, your questions and uh, stay tuned and see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye